Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. We're going to take up a couple of, of, of questions. And uh, thank you for the questions. I, I mean that. I mean that uh, right from my heart. I mean it. Thank you for uh, the questions that you send in. Uh, don't ever think, wow, I don't think I'll ever send a question. What if pastor answers on Wednesday night like that one last Wednesday night? <laughs> I mean, you, you, you ought to be really happy about, yes. you know, our, our Bible our Bible says the love of God, not the hatred of God, not the anger of God, not you upset God, not God's ticked at you or miffed at you or, 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 or teed off at you. And so he's going to unload on you. No, the Bible says he loves you. He, he, if you go a certain direction, you have a certain practice in your life. It might be your words and the way you talk. It might be the way you think, you know, right and wrong thinking, right and wrong speaking, right and wrong living. And, and the Lord loves you, he's going to point that out to you. This isn't right. And the Bible says that's evidence of his L-O-V-E. Yes. Hebrews chapter 12, Revelation chapter 3. Whom the Lord loves, he leaves alone and lets him, no. lets him, no, no, he's, he's always going to point it out. That's evidence of God's love for me that somebody's going to point that out to me. The love of God saved a prophet from being stricken down by an angel. The angel was standing right in the gap in the wall with his sword drawn, going to lop his head off because he was totally disobeying God and going to curse God's people. And the love of God caused that donkey to turn around and talk to his master and say, what is your problem? And only the love of God will stop a person in their tracks and not let them go on to a, a place that will curse their own life and, and destroy themselves. God will try to do that in a variety of means. Uh, and I'm, gra I'm grateful for one. I'm grateful that he does that. So uh, thanks for the questions, even though the answer may not be exactly, you know, what you expected or, or what you were anticipating. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to have them. So here's one that we haven't addressed yet, or maybe we just very, very briefly mentioned on it. But it says, I have a family friend who's Jewish. He has a strong heart for God but does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Any, any suggestions? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. So uh, if you're looking for my suggestions, here's my suggestions. I'll go even better. I'll give you advice. I'll advise you. I'll, I'll give you advisement. I have a family friend who's Jewish, has a strong heart for God, but doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah. Any questions? Number one, pray. Yeah. Exclamation. Pray. Pray. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells you that there's a, a blinder that's been placed over the, the eyes of the, of, of the heart uh, of those people who are, are Jewish, and it's going to remain there until it's taken away. Pray for them that that's taken away. Pray for them that that blinders, the blinders to not see that Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus was the Messiah that they'd been waiting for, and there isn't another one coming. And, 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 and that's number one, uh, pray. Now I want you to turn over to Romans chapter one. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, starting with verse one. All right, so you love the word and you're a doer of it, uh, at least some portion of you, <clears throat> by, by your own confession. And so what does it say here? What's the first thing that you should do? Pray. Ready? Yes. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and what? Prayer. Prayer to God for Israel. Now, it says something in the margin of my study Bible here. It says, my own people. My own people. Paul was a Jew. He says so emphatically in the book of Galatians. He says, my heart's desire for the Jews my heart's desire for Israel, my heart's desire for my own people, and my prayer is that they might be saved. So pray for them. 
Pray for them. Doesn't matter if they're Jewish or Catholic or Methodist or, or go to an independent spirit-filled church. Doesn't matter if they're Lutheran or Baptist, Episcopalian or Presbyterian. Doesn't matter if they're Jewish uh, or, or, or Christian. Doesn't matter if they're Orthodox. Doesn't matter. Just pray for them that they be saved. That's what Paul says right here. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel, for the Jews, for my own people, is that they might be saved. Now that ought to tell you something. You, you ought to read that verse and it ought to communicate something to you. Do you get it? Did you see it? Do you hear it? It's just, it's just as plain as a slap in the face. Jews are not saved. Just because they're Jews, contrary to what some pretty well-known ministers try to communicate, and they fumble all over their self as they try to prove from the Bible that Jews don't need to receive Jesus to go to heaven. Uh, you just have far too much water to wade through and far too many verses and far too many scriptures and far too much truth to have to ignore to ever prove that. When the Bible says there's only one door and, his, and, and it's Jesus. There's, there's only one Savior. There's only one Messiah. And that's Jesus. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. There is no other. Don't wait for another. There's no other way in. I am the door. There's no other way in. I. How about this one? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. And it doesn't matter what nationality you are. It doesn't matter what genealogy you are. It doesn't matter what ethnic group you're a part of. It doesn't matter what family you came from. And for, as, you, as for you, it doesn't matter who your granddaddy and who your grandmama was. It doesn't matter who your auntie was and who your uncle was. It doesn't matter what your family name was. It doesn't matter if your parents were saved. Or it doesn't matter if they were heathens. That has no bearing on you accepting and receiving and confessing and professing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. And neither does their faith life guarantee you access into all of God's blessings here and all of God's presence for all of eternity. That's a personal decision made by every human being. And the Apostle Paul, who destroyed the Christian faith and was out to arrest and persecute and imprison and jail and torture and murder Christians, had a run-in with that living Savior, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and it changed him. And he said, I have to go back and I have to study this. And he went back to Tarsus and he spent eight years and then he went to Jerusalem and presented himself and then he went back for another three years. He studied for 11 years to come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he proclaimed it everywhere he went. And he tried to proclaim it to his own people. That was his heart's cry. But the Lord spoke to him on that day and said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. You can want to do something for the Lord so bad. You can want to do something and be so convinced that it's a great work and it's a godly work. But if it isn't the Lord's plan, you're going to just wrestle and struggle and eventually it'll fizzle. And that's what it did for him. Got him thrown in prison, thrown in jail. Had to do the rest of his ministry from a prison cell. Didn't have to happen, but it did. The Lord's call on him was to go to the Gentiles, not his own people. And, and so he's, he's, he's heart's cry here. There's, there's nothing wrong with having a heart's cry for your family or for your culture or for your nation uh, or, 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 or for your people. As it was in his case, that was his heart's cry. His prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. That means they weren't. For I bear them record. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God. Notice this person's question. I have a family friend that's Jewish that he has a strong heart for God. Yeah, absolutely. So, so here it says, I bear them record that they have a zeal for God. It says in the margin here, a devotion for God, but not according to Bible knowledge. Not according to God's knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, that's right standing with God, are going about to do what? Establish their own righteousness having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. How does righteousness come from God? Through His Son. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He who knew no sin 
was made to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So your being in Christ is what causes you to be right with God. Not being of the right genealogy, right culture, right society, right nation, uh, being able to look through your family tree and find out where you came from. They being ignorant of God's righteousness, bring my whiteboard up here if you will. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they've not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of God. For Christ is the end of the law. Can't make it any clearer than that. For righteousness to everyone that believes. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them, but the righteousness which is of faith, say that with me, of faith. Of faith. The righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Don't say in your heart, who shall ascend up into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend in thee, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. See, the Lord doesn't have to do anything else. He doesn't have to die again, doesn't have to descend from heaven again. There's no other Messiah coming. He's not, he's not, there's going to be the Messiah coming, and it's going to be the second coming. And he's going to catch away those who have placed their faith and hope and trust and confidence and reliance upon him. And those are the only ones that are going. The righteousness which comes by faith does not say Christ needs to come down again or Christ needs to descend into the deep again or Christ needs to be brought up again from the dead again. But what does it say? Verse 8, what does it say? The word is near to you even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. That if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That means he's the Messiah. You will be saved. Now go back to verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel. My heart's desire and prayer for my own people. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Verse 9. If you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. And believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Go back to verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer for the Jews, for Israel, for my people, is that they what? Be saved. If you'll confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. There is no two ways that's required for salvation. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, not with works, not with keeping the law, not with keeping all the feasts and all the festivals, not, not, not with taking everything out of your house, not with killing a little bitty lamb. No, righteousness comes by believing. For with the heart, man believes, and the result of that is righteousness, unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made, Unto salvation. Praise God. I said, Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, there's a couple of the verses. I'm not going to have time to read all of those. Uh, Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29. I'm just giving you the references here. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Romans 3 and verse 9. 3 and verse 9. 20 through 24. Chapter 3, verses 20 through 24. Chapter 3, verses 28 through 30. 28 through 30. And then, right here in Romans chapter 10, look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. Verse 11 says, as the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference. I mean, you ought to underline that, highlight that. If you've ever received any contrary teaching of that, just read your Bible. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And whosoever, verse 13, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Jew or Gentile. Not some of the Jews, not most of the Jews. No, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It's, it's exactly the same plan. It's exactly the, 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 the same provision. Uh, and and uh, if, you, if you have a person, it doesn't matter if they're Jewish or it doesn't matter if they're, uh, if they're a church member. It doesn't matter uh, if, if they're a pagan. If they don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the only doorway in. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Narrow is the gate. It's really plain. There's no difference between Jews and Greeks. Previous verse. There is no difference between Jew or Greek. The same Lord is over all and rich unto all that call upon him. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And whosoever doesn't call upon the name of the Lord doesn't matter what family they're a part of or culture they're a part of or what religion they're a part of. But pastor, what about all the other religions and all the good people and all the well-meaning people? And, and there's, there's got to be some other provision for them. No, there's only one provision. There's only one provision. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And there is no salvation in any other. Acts 4.12, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other way to salvation. There's no other way to heaven. There's no stairway to heaven. There's no working your way to heaven. There, there's no earning your way, deserving your way. Well, what if I keep all the commandments? They can't. They couldn't. You can't. Jesus did. Done. Yep, and, and you accept him and everything he did, and, and uh, that's what God requires, that you accept his son. All right, there's one other verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Every person on planet earth and some of them in heaven are described in this verse. Everybody. Everybody. Ready? First Corinthians, what chapter? What verse? Somebody interpret. Verse 32. Verse 32. Giving no offense in anything, either to the... Help me. Here, here, here's, here's one. There's, there's, we're going to list one group of people. What's this group of people? The Jews, okay? Who are the Jews? They were a group of Abraham's ancestors, and God made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and the covenant that he made down through those people. That's how they were termed God's chosen people. And God's blessing. The, the covenant came to them. God's word came to them. God showed himself mighty and strong on them, on their behalf. They fought their battles with his assistance and his help. That was the group of people he brought into the promised land. It was through the Jews, the tribe of Judah, that he came into planet Earth and came into the family. And yet they were the very ones that rejected him. John chapter 1, verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own rejected him. His own received him not. There were a very select few that recognized him, came back to their brothers in the boat, came back to their friends and said, We found him. We found the one that's the Messiah. When he asked them, Who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Ah, they think you're a prophet. They think you're a great teacher. But who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one. See, God opened their eyes to that. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that was the answer that, that, uh, that Peter gave. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, the Jews were set apart from every other people on planet Earth. Think about that. Every other people. That's who God chose to be in covenant with. In the New Testament, he chooses, it doesn't matter if they're Jews or if they're not Jews, he, he chooses to be in covenant with those who accept his son. Because God's heart and God's desire and God's will has always been to glorify his son. 
That's God's full intent, to glorify his son. His son's full intent is to glorify his father. And he loved the world so much, the whole world, everybody in it, Jew or Gentile. And that, that is the designation of every single person in the world. The Jews are God's chosen people, and that's one single solitary group, and you have to be born into it. All right? What's the other group that makes up the rest of all of the world? Non-Jews or Gentiles, or as this verse says, Greeks. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Giving no offense, none whatsoever, neither to the Jews or to the Gentiles. And so if you're not a Jew, then, then you're in this group over there. It doesn't matter how bad you don't want to be one. <laughs> you're one. You are one, and it, it, no choice of yours. Just because you weren't born here and you were born here, you are a Gentile. But there's a third group in this verse. And it says, giving none offense, no, not to anyone, not to Jews, not to Gentiles, nor to who? The to the church of God. The church. The C H U. R C H. That's the third group. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church, a general assembly, and church of the firstborn. The family of God, both in heaven and on earth. Those who are redeemed, those who are blood washed, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, who've accepted him as Messiah, know he is God's son, received them as Savior, been changed by his power, and who now belong to his family. That's the church, and it doesn't matter if they come out of the Jews to become part of the church or the Gentiles to come out of the church. That's all there is. And no aliens flying around in saucers. Nobody crawls out of the mud, and, 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 and there's this special group named just for them. Sorry, but are no mermaids. Swim around half fish. No, there's Jews and Gentiles. That makes up the whole human race. And out of the Jews and out of the Gentiles, they can become part of the church. Those who are justified. Those who are sanctified. Those who are righteous because of the blood that was shed on Calvary. And if they aren't part of the church, the family of God, the body of Christ, then they're still just Jews or they're still just Gentiles, but they're not saved. And whether they're Jews or Gentiles, they need to be saved because there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over all and rich to all who will call upon him. And if they won't call upon him, they're just going to stay unsaved. Doesn't matter if they're Jews, they're not saved. The apostle said, my prayer for them is that they would get saved. They're not. They're not because they came from the tribe of Dan or they came from the tribe of Ichikar or they came from the tribe of Manasseh or I can trace myself all the way back to Abraham himself. Jesus said we could raise up stones and, and become children to Abraham. They were bragging about something that didn't cause them to be right with God. He chose them. He poured everything through them. They rejected him. They left him again and again and over and over. And when he came and dwelt right in their midst, they, they murdered him. He didn't hold that against them. He said, if you'll accept me and believe, me, believe in me. And there were quite a number that did. Remember the eighth chapter of the book of, uh, of John? Many believed on him, but they didn't confess him because they were afraid they'd be thrown out of the synagogue. Yeah. Forget the synagogue. Go to heaven. Amen. 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 So, so again, uh, my counsel to you would be pray for him. Yeah, pray for him. Pray for him. Don't give him some false hope. Don't, 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 accept, don't accept some, some false hope. And then, then that goes for every Gentile person. That means non-Jew that you know. Don't give them a false hope. Well, I think you're a good person. I mean, you're a good mom. You're a good dad. I mean, I mean you know, you, you, you go to church. 
You give money. You sing in the choir. You teach Sunday school. You help little old ladies across the street. You help the poor. You contribute to good works. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal uh, of, of his Holy Spirit. So, so isn't this a great verse? I said, isn't this a great verse? Jews or Gentiles or the church. So it doesn't matter what you used to be. There's only one church and it doesn't matter where you came from. Uh, leave all that, check all that at the door, what you used to be, uh, what you used to be a part of, good or bad, leave it. Amen. Isn't that a great question? I, I, I thought it was. I thought it was a great question. All right, next, next. Dr. Barclay talks often about getting fixed. What does that look like? I thought we weren't perfected until heaven. Dr. Barkley often talks about getting fixed. What does that look like? I thought we weren't perfected until heaven. Uh, once, we, once we see him face to face, we'll know him as we're known. And that is an, that is an accurate biblical fact. It's not an assumption. It's a biblical fact. We'll be perfected. In that moment, we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And every imperfection will disappear. Every imperfection will disappear. Turn over to Ephesians chapter, chapter 5. Here's the marriage verses. Aren't you glad they're in your Bible? Yes. Ephesians chapter 5 starts off, wives, verse 22. Submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the church. He's talking about the church here. You ought to highlight every time he mentions church down through this section. And he's the Savior. He is the Savior. He's not one of the Saviors. He's the only Savior. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. No man ever yet nourishes and cherishes his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. Now go back up to 26 and 27. It says, it says Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might do what? That he might, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself. See, not you present yourself. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You are never going to be holy and without blemish. You are never going to be without spot or wrinkle. You are never going to be sanctified and cleansed and washed without the Lord's work. You are not going to be able to go to heaven and say, look what I did to myself. The Lord began a good work in you. Yes, yes. Philippians 1 verse 6, he began a good work in you and he will continue to do the work in you and perform it until the day that he returns, till the day that he comes back. He's going to be working on you a mighty long time. <laughs> Some of us he's been working on a mighty long time and he's not, and he's not, and he's not finished yet. And so there are a few verses that we could, that, that we could look to. I mean, you take a, a biblical principle, a biblical truth, just like that one right there. Because what happens, I first learned this from uh, an, an elder in the body of Christ, an older minister. Uh, and, and I heard Dr. Hagen say, he said, I heard him say personally, he said, I watch people that take these verses and I watch people that try to make it something that we do. 
I, I watch, they try to preach that we present ourselves without spot or wrinkle, without blemish or any such thing. And every time I do, I watch them fall into a works mentality. Every single time. Because they're trying to do something that only the Lord can do. They're trying to work out all the wrinkles and all the blemishes and all the spots and, 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 and live in, in, in perfection when only the Lord can do that. And all you have to do is just read your Bible and it says he will present to himself. He'll be, do, he'll be doing the presenting. Don't you love the book of Jude? Only just, just one chapter in the book of Jude, right before Revelation, the last book of the Bible, you find Jude only has one, only has one chapter. Uh, and, and uh, oh boy, it's just hard to read uh, without read, starting at verse 20. But you, beloved, building up yourself. See, there's things that you do. Yes. Yes. Never, never, uh, never try to take, take God's place. There, there, there are his responsibilities. His, and there are your responsibilities. Yours. You can't do his, and he won't do yours. I said, you can't do his, and he won't do yours. See, here's what your Bible says. Uh, here's what your Bible says. Let's see. Let's see before I get there. Ready? My Bible says in James chapter 1, Verse 21, therefore lay apart all filthiness and excessive naughtiness. That's excessive sinfulness. Lay apart, say it. I mean, that's lay it off to the side. Filthiness and excessive sinfulness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. All right, that, that's, that's just a little bit differently, but saying really the same thing in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. This is your reasonable service to present yourself. Holy acceptable unto God. That's your, that's your responsibility. And do not be conformed to the world. That means don't, don't talk like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't live like the world. Don't look like the world. Yeah, don't be conformed to this world. That's your responsibility. That's not his. And be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's your responsibility. That's not his. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's something that we do. That's something that, 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 that I do on purpose. Yes. Amen. I said on purpose. Amen. All right. Here's another good verse. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Having therefore these promises, what promises? I mean, that's the first verse. But he said, therefore, having these promises. So you have to go back a couple of verses. You have to go back a couple of verses. Go back just two verses into the, into the sixth chapter. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, 18. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Now, who's the them that he's talking about there? Well, the unbelievers, the infidels. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteous? So come out from among the unrighteous. People that aren't saved, people that aren't Christians, people that don't name the, the, the name of Jesus. What communion has light with darkness? Calls them, calls them the temple of idols. Calls them infidels. <laughs> calls them Belial. Yep. And, 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 and he says in verse 17, come out from among them, be ye separate. Is that God's responsibility or yours? That's mine, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Unclean means forbidden. And I'll be to you a father, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. That's not something the Lord's doing. Get it out of your life. Get it out of your mind. Get it out of your heart. Amen. Get it out of your mouth. Amen. And again, get it out of your life. <laughs> cleanse yourself of all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. Now, we, we read James chapter 1, verse 21. We read Romans chapter 1, 
verses 1 and 2, or Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We read 2 Corinthians 7, actually chapter 6, 17, 18, and 7 and verse 1. We could read Ephesians chapter 4 if you're going to keep looking at me with that frame of... of, of <laughs> We could just go right down through Ephesians chapter 4 that, that says perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Don't be angry. Don't let your anger cause you to sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. By the way, the sun's already down tonight, so. Don't give place to the devil. Don't steal. Work a good job. Give. Let no cor Oh, here we go. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That'd be lying, gossip, tail-bearing, complaining, uh -huh. murmuring, grumbling, cussing, swearing, dirty jokes, uh -huh. fear, doubt, evil report, uh -huh. unbelief. Yeah. Did I say complaining? Yeah. I'll say it again. Complaining? Yeah. 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 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, building up that it may minister grace. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away. Be kind-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving others as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Be followers of God. Walk in love. I'm already down chapter five. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. Let it not once be named among you. Neither filthiness or foolish talking or jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving thanks. See, these are all things that we do. And then one final verse. Say, thank you, Pastor. All right, you're... one final verse. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, being compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run with perseverance the race set before us. Doesn't say run with skill, run with agility, run with talent, run with speed, or run with strength. It says run with perseverance. That means don't give up, don't quit. Amen. Don't quit. That may very well be the sin that so easily besets us to give up, to throw up the white flag, to 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 give in, to fold. Oh, pastor. I'm at the end of my rope. I'll tie a knot and hang on. Yes, amen. Don't you ever get to the end of your rope? My rope ain't got no end. Come on. Amen. Let me tell you about my rope. Jude. I said the book of Jude. Are you there? Come on, Jude. All of you just walking in from, uh, from uh, youth uh, choir practice, uh, uh, kids choir, uh, highest praise. I get it. We're in Jude. We're in Jude. We're wrapping up. It's our last verse. You got just, just in time. Jude, you, you, we're giving a memory verse here. We'll get to it. We started up in verse 20. See, these are things that we do. We're talking about things that are God's responsibility. And that's every, every, every wrinkle, every spot presenting to himself a glorious church. Presenting him to himself. That's, that, that's what he does. That, that's his responsibility. My responsibility is everything I read out of James chapter 1, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7, and Hebrews chapter 12, amongst other things, like uh, Malachi 3.3.10. 3, Why did I just think of that? Must be somebody watching. Welcome those of you who are streaming. All right, yeah, everything that the Bible says is my responsibility, I do. Anything the Bible says is God's responsibility, I'd be foolish to try to do. Come on. I'm not going to present myself. Right. He is. Only he can do that. But you, beloved, tells us what we're to do, verse 20. You there, Jude, verse 20? Yeah, yeah. Building up yourself on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Lord, Lord, I feel so weak. Lord, I feel so powerless. Lord, I just pray in today that you would give me strength. Let's see. But you, beloved, build yourself up. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. You, build yourself up. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Build me up, Lord. 
I lift me up, Lord. No, no, no. You build yourself up. You build yourself up. You think what you want, but I've come to the conclusion after years of studying God's holy written word that if I'm weak and, and if I'm powerless as a believer, it is not God's fault. That's right. And I don't have to ask him for one other, one more thing of, of empowerment. He tells me in the Old Testament, he says, they that wait upon the Lord. Not the not the they that cry and beg and whine and 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 say I don't know. that person's always strong in the Lord and power of His might, but you know I'm I'm weak and timid and spineless and devils are chasing me all over the place and I got trouble. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen and I've you know what? Build up yourself. That's what your Bible says. They that wait upon the Lord, they'll they'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. All right, come on, time's ticking. All right, but they do run out of time. Keep yourself, keep yourself, keep yourself in the love of God. That's not God's responsibility. It's not your pastor's responsibility. It's not your enemy's responsibility. It's not your friend's responsibility. It's not one of your family members' responsibility. You keep yourself in the love of God. Well, everybody isn't easy to love. No, that's exactly right. Your Bible says love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. Love people. Amen. Whose responsibility is that? It's mine. Keep yourself in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Of some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Period. Yeah. Period. Amen. Ready? Here's a verse. Yes. Here's a verse. Now unto him. Yes. Now unto him. See, I'm not able to do this. Now unto him. Yes. You're not able to do this. Now unto him. You're not altogether able to do this. Now unto him that is able. Say it. He is able. He is I'm able. not able. I'm You're not able. able. But he is able. He is. What's he able? He's able to keep you from falling and... He's not only able to keep me upright. He's not only able to keep me from stumbling and going over the edge. He's not only able to keep me from falling. He's able to keep me from falling and. Yes. He's able to keep me on my feet and. He's able to keep me upright and. He's able to keep me and. Keep me from falling and present you faultless. You may never be able to keep yourself faultless. There'll be, there'll be something that's your fault. <laughs> it is your fault. I'm at fault. I was wrong. Lord, I forgive. I, I've sinned. Forgive me. Confess your faults. <coughs> Confess your sins. And he's, a, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all sin. But he is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Hallelujah. I mean, when you get there, you're going to be faultless. Now you're not right now. You're not. Now there's things to work on. Now you have to lay certain things aside. Now you have to, now you have to give your attention and renew your mind with, to, to and with God's word. Now you have to separate some things out of your life. Now you have to not let the sun go down on your anger. Now you have to Apart from yourself, certain language and, and, and certain, certain thoughts and, and maybe even certain, certain people. But, but he's able, on that day, he'll present you faultless. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. With, you may not be too happy about what you look like today or the person you are right now, but glory to God on that day when that trumpet sounds and you're changed in the twinkling of an eye, you're going you're gonna to look around and say, Woo, look what the Lord has done. Look at me. Look what he started with. Look what he ended up with. He's going to present you before his father and say, this is one of mine. They're faultless. No wrinkle, no spot, no blemish. Only he can do that. Only he can do that. That doesn't alleviate me from my responsibility right now here at this time in this life. And, and, and it doesn't mean that I can take his responsibility and I could present myself faultless. Now, real quick, answer the question. He talks about getting fixed. What does that look like? Here's what it looks like. Repent! 
That's what it looks like. Just repent. We've been teaching uh, the, the last seven epistles of the Bible, the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches, and, and, and six times in there, five times in there, he says, repent. That, that, means, that means if you're doing wrong, change. That means make a heart adjustment. That means be, be, be contrite. That means if you're corrected, smile and, and be a wise man. If you correct a wise man, he'll love you for it. If you correct a fool, he'll hate you for it. But, but, but it, it, re, love correction. Love correction, desire correction. We, we, we learned that's one of the keys to, to biblical, biblical prosperity. And, 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 and love people and forgive everybody of everything. And that's all just part of the process of developing and, and submitting yourself and presenting yourself and presenting your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Before, that's your reasonable service. And so everything he says in there, you just keep working at that. And when you need to repent, repent. All right, what else does it mean? Receive help. Yeah, receive help. What does this look like? Receive help. Ask for help. Desire help. Crave help. Come and get helped. What does that, well, what does it look like? Fix yourself. Humble yourself. That's what it looks like. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. James chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. That, that's, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. Fix yourself. Humble yourself. Repent of pride. Repent of stinginess. Repent of, 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 of self-centeredness. Uh, read your Bible and do what it says. Change every ta- everything that's necessary. And don't think it's all going to get changed in one heartbeat and in one, one moment, and in one day. You got changed from darkness to light, from death to life, from, from being uh, a child of the devil to being a child of God. That's the greatest change that'll ever take place, and the rest of it is a little at a time. I said the rest of it is just a little at a time, one hour at a time, one moment at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time, uh, a year at a time. So when, when Dr. Barclay talks about fixing yourself, why, you know, nobody else can close that I'll just talk to myself for a minute. That big mouth of yours. So nobody else can do that. You, you just have to do that yourself. That's what fix yourself means. Fix yourself means get over yourself. F- fix yourself means quit worrying about tomorrow and trust God. Fix yourself. That means make adjustments as they are necessary. That's what fix yourself means. Do everything that the Bible says is your part. And then when you get to heaven, you are exactly right. Whoever asks that question, you are exactly right. Uh, That's when perfection will come. That's when perfection will come. But then I got news for you. You have to keep yourself that way. Yeah, even in heaven, you have to guard yourself against. Just because you're in heaven, I mean, the last group, uh, uh, a third of them got booted out because they didn't guard their heart diligently. So that, I mean, that's another thing the Lord told us to do. Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart. Don't let everything seep into there. Don't be conformed to the world. Those are things we have to do. Well, let's stand. Our, our altar ministers will come right here to the altar and, and uh, they'll be available to pray for you before you leave. If you'd like uh, someone to pray with you, over you, for you, anoint you with oil, lay hands on you, pray for you for any circumstance or situation in life, come and uh, one of these will pray with you. Our Bible says, I I remind you on occasion, our Bible says, uh, exhort one another. Exhort one another. Especially as you see that day approaching. That day is Christ's return. It's closer now than it was last Wednesday night. Closer now than it was Sunday. Closer now than it was when the sun came up this morning. It's closer now than when the sun went down on the western horizon just a little while ago. It's it's, it's closer every every time the, the clock strikes a second the Lord's return is closer so as you see that day approaching exhort one another just encourage one another be a blessing to one another find a good verse tell it to maybe 10 people before you leave yeah the Lord's on your side if God be for you who can be against you yeah we're more than conquerors in all of these things we're more than conquerors you can do all things through Christ who strengthens God's grace is sufficient for you uh, as he is, so are you in this world. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. And just make it a practice. It's part of your ministry. You're a minister of God, and part of your ministry is to the world out there. Preach the gospel. Proclaim the good news to everybody everywhere. 
part of your ministry is in here, inside the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether they go to this building to, to worship and be discipled or not. They might go to another one. It's still your responsibility to them as a Christian to uh, exhort one another, to exhort them, exhort them. I just want to remind you tonight that your name is written in heaven, that there's a book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life. Say your name right now, full name. That name's in there. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you might have some faults, fissures, might have some little deals you're still working on, might have some stuff that needs to be, you know, cleaned up and washed off, but that doesn't take your name out of that book. Your name is in the book of life. The Lamb's book of life. You never be judged according to your works at the great white throne judgment. You'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ where the one who made you spotless without blemish or wrinkle, he'll say, this is one of mine. This is one of mine. Have a great night. God bless you. We're dismissed in Jesus. Name. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 815 and 1030, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.